and so we can start whenever you want. Okay then, shall I hand over to Simon? Simon, would you like to lead us in prayer this morning? Okay. Good morning, St. James. Let's pray using the words of Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Father, we come before you this morning to offer you our praise and worship. We will become with grateful hearts to give thanks and to celebrate your goodness. Father, draw near to us now and fill us with a real sense of your presence and help us to worship you in spirit and truth this morning. Amen. Amen.
Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for bringing us here today. We ask, Lord, now that you pour your presence out on us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, speak to our hearts. Let us now really just enter into that moment with you, knowing that you are present here. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you that you died for us, that you rose for us, that you are alive today and that we can know you. We pray now you help us, Lord, to just move into that place with you. And Lord, let us just now give every moment this week to you that's been difficult. Maybe think of those things that have been difficult for you this week. Those things that have been hard to hear. Those things in the news that have been difficult. Lord, we thank you that you are in control of our world. You are in charge of our world and we give you our world and our nation and our lives and our community. We pray that in everything, Lord, we may be the one family, the family of God, proclaiming your name. And let us as well in this moment just give over anything that we may regret having said, done or thought. Knowing that you're a God who's eager to give us a new day every day. So lay them down before the cross now. In this moment, just think of those things, those things you've not trusted God with this week. Those attitudes you wish you'd not had. Those things you wish you hadn't said or done. In that moment, just give them to Jesus. And receive his forgiveness. Walk in the truth that you are free. And Lord, help us to be different, to learn, to seek you every day. Fill us with the power of your spirit that we may be equipped to do your kingdom work. Release on us gifts, gifts of the healing, gifts of prophecy gifts of teaching, gifts of administration. Lord, whatever those gifts are, release them on us, Lord, that we may see that, Lord, in you, we can accomplish anything. We welcome you, Jesus, into our lives, into our community here. We welcome you in your presence. We welcome your healing. We desire to hear from you. We desire to be led by you. Come, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, everyone. Amen. I'm now going to hand over to Keisha, who's going to bring our reading, and Simon is going to bring um, our words today. So, Keisha. Today's reading is from Romans 5, verse 1 to 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us all. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For it, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. 
<laughs> thank you uh, thank you Keisha for that um, hello everyone good morning um, hopefully I'll stay with you for the whole of the sermon this morning my internet connection has been a little bit flaky over the last week apologize if I cut out halfway through but I have to say it can be very frustrating at work I'm in the middle of a big meeting maybe we're talking about the budget and there's lots of detailed arguments going on and then all of a sudden I lose the connection I'll struggle out around to try and get it back and then by the time I get back in the whole argument has moved on and my colleagues have said right that's what we're doing and that's the budget and I've lost the plot completely but I have to admit um, it's going to feel a bit like that this morning we're starting a, a short series in the book of Romans today but we're starting at chapter five now Romans is a big letter it's a letter that contains that the most complete, uh, the most well-argued case that Paul makes for how Jesus' life and his death put us right with God. And there is a reason that I didn't try and cover Romans in my five-minute summaries of Paul's letters that we were looking at just around Easter time. And to leap in at chapter five of Romans is a bit like joining a video call halfway through where you've missed most of the arguments. Now the good news for all of you sitting at home is that I'm not going to try and do a sermon which includes all of chapters one to four as well this morning. Um, but I do need to at least tell you where we've got to in Paul's arguments and then you can go away this afternoon and you can read chapters one to four for yourselves. Now first three letters of Paul's letter, the first three chapters rather of Paul's letter to the Romans sets out a key problem that we all face in our lives. Bigger than the virus, bigger than war, bigger than climate change, bigger even than the challenges that we've seen over the last few weeks of, of oppression and, uh, um, and prejudice. And the problem is what happens when we face our creator God? And the first three chapters introduce a really, really difficult subject, the wrath of God, God's anger. You see, God is perfect. He, he can't stand evil. He is completely set against evil. He wants all evil things expunged completely from the world that he created perfect. But here's the problem. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of these perfect standards that God has set. None of us is righteous. And righteous is a key word throughout this first part of the book of Romans. None of us can meet God, none of us can be blessed by God, none of us can talk to God. Quite frankly, none of us should even be allowed to live on earth in the presence of God because the sin that we have all done is a barrier between us and God. Now, the partial good news is that God holds back from punishing us, even though we deserve it, because he is a merciful God as well as being a just God and a perfect God and a holy God. And in chapter three, Paul tells his readers that God in his forbearance had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. But in the long run, there are only two futures for us, for me and you, in the face of a holy God. Either we have to live a completely sin-free life, and we've just been told by Paul that that's impossible, or we must die for those sins. As the letter says a bit later on, the wages of sin is death. But are those really the only two options? Well, Paul looks at a few other possibilities. Uh, he, he looks at whether Jews could be saved. Jews are God's chosen people. Jews are the ones chosen way back when Abraham was around uh, to be God's messengers and God's uh, the way that God got his message out to the world and rescued the world and showed how good he was, would they be saved? Uh, and Paul says no. In chapter 3 verse 9 he says Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. And then Paul looks at maybe those who've never heard about God, who've never been told about this. Surely those people don't deserve to die. Uh, but Paul says no again. He says there's enough in the creation around us, there's enough in our God-given consciences such that everyone should know what is right and what is wrong. And everyone should know that there is a creator who should be worshipped. Chapter one says that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, they've been clearly seen and they've been understood from what has been made. So people are without excuse. But clearly there are some people who are put right with God, who are 
justified, another key word in, in this letter. So what is going on here? Well, the truth is that that justification, that is a gift from God. Abraham, the father of God's chosen people, he believed in God, he followed God, he put his faith in God, and that faith was credited to him as righteousness. God made Abraham right with him as a gift. But even that isn't the whole story, because even for Abraham and all for all those faithful people who had been made righteous as a gift, the penalty for their sin, the price that they had to pay for the sin that they committed, that price still had to be paid. And that righteousness that they'd been given by God, that righteousness had to come from somewhere. And the answer is that it was through Jesus' death on the cross to take the punishment for our sin. And it was through his perfect life and his resurrection that makes us perfect. And Paul sums it up just before our passage this morning starts. At the end of chapter four, he says this. He says that the message that God gave to Abraham wasn't for him alone, but it was also for us, for me and you to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. That is the solution to the problem. And therefore, and therefore is where we start chapter five. And in chapter five, our reading today, Paul answers the so what question. He says, because we've been justified, because our relationship with God can be restored, there are six things that we know are true, six promises that we can hold on to if we trust in Jesus. And I'm going to put those six promises in the chat now so that you can see where we're going as I go through the sermon. Those six promises are, first of all, we've got peace with God. Secondly, we can receive God's grace. And I'll tell you a bit about what grace means in a minute. Third, we've got a hope. We've got hope of glory ahead of us. Fourth, we are going to suffer, but we can rejoice in that suffering. Fifth, we are saved from God's wrath. And then six, because of that restored relationship, we will be able to rejoice in all the great things in those first five promises. So that's where we're going this morning. And we'll go through those one by one. So first of all, uh, we have peace with God. That's there in verse one. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Peace is the main target of God's plans. His motivation is his love for us, but his target is peace. But where is peace today? Well, there isn't peace in the world, is there? There's not very much peace between people. The relationship between humans and God, well, that has been destroyed because of the sin that came into the world. And the relationship between humans and the rest of God's creation, well, that's destroyed too at the same time. And we see that in the, con the consequences of that today in the mess that we've made of the world and the environment around us. And there will be no peace between humans and God if we carry on rebelling in our sin. But the Bible tells us that Jesus came as the Prince of Peace. That was one of the titles given to this messenger that God was going to send, this Messiah. The Old Testament prophets looked forward to a time when God's rule on this earth would be restored when it will be set back the way that he intended it, when there would be a new heaven and a new earth, and when there would be total, complete peace. The prophet Micah says that this Prince of Peace will judge between many people and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. And that peace includes rebuilding the bridge between God and us. Reconciliation, again, a word which comes up there at the end of the, of the, of the passage today. Never again will we be banished from God's presence like Adam and Eve were. Never again will we have to fear punishment for our rebellion. We are at peace. So then we move on to our second promise, which is God's grace in verse two. Now, grace is a word that describes the whole process that Paul has described in the first four chapters. Grace is God giving us good things that we don't deserve because he loves us and that are made possible because of Jesus' death and resurrection. But this promise in chapter five, verse two, is more than just we've got grace. It talks about gaining access to this grace. And this promise has the sense of being welcomed into a graceful place. 
it's the difference between receiving a gift from somebody who comes to your door and drops it on the doorstep and then walks away two meters, has a quick chat and then goes home. It's the difference between that and that and, and walking in and enjoying opening that present together and sharing it and spending time with each other, being in a place where that present can be shared. That is the sense that you've got of walking into God's presence. And it's not just a, a one-off, it's, it's not just transient. You see, it says we stand in grace, we stay in grace. Being as part of God's grace is something that we can have forever because of our salvation and being put right with God that we've seen in the first four chapters of the letter. Then we move on to our, our third promise. We've got hope. And that's there in the second half of verse two, this grace. Uh, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, we need to be really careful when we think about the word hope, because hope has all sorts of meanings. We might hope it won't rain if we go for a picnic, although that hope isn't necessarily always based on evidence. And we, we might have read the weather forecast and we actually really know it is going to rain. We might hope that the lockdown will end next week, but we all know that's not going to happen. No, Christian hope is based around firm expectations of the promises that God has made. Hope's very closely linked with faith. Um, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And just like faith, hope isn't wishful thinking. Hope is living our lives with the assurance that God loves us, that he saved us, and that he's promised us life with him when we enter that kingdom uh, in full. And what are we hoping for here in this passage? Well, we're hoping for the glory of God. And the expectation that we've got um, at the end of this life um, as it is now, the expectation is that we will see Jesus and God in all of their glory. We will see the Jesus which is, who is portrayed in the book of Revelation that we've been looking at uh, over the last few weeks. Not the Jesus that's a humble carpenter in Nazareth, but the Jesus that's risen again in glory. And the reason Paul wants us to share this glory and to, look for, to, to, to hope for this glory is that we are going to share it. We too are going to have glorious bodies when the new heavens and the new earth finally come. We were created to be the image of the God of glory here on earth, but we have messed this image up. As Paul says earlier on in this letter, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But just like the whole of creation has fallen, now the whole of creation will be restored to that glory. And we've got a certain hope of that as well. And as the hymn says, finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless, let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love and praise. So that's our first three promises, some really great things that we can hold on to there. But now we come to promise number four. This is a bit more serious. Promise number four says we will suffer. Now that doesn't sound as much fun as the others, does it? Joel talked an awful lot about Christian suffering a few weeks ago. So I'm not going to spend too long on this, but please do go back and have a look at Joel's sermon on the Facebook page or on, on the YouTube channel. And there's a lot of suffering that I know many of you are facing at the moment. We're suffering with our health. People are suffering with their, their mental health because of the, the effects of being alone and being in lockdown. There is more suffering coming because of the economic hardships that we will face. People will lose their jobs. People will, uh, companies will go under. Charities will fail. But it's really important to remember that the suffering that you and I face as Christians is a normal part of Christian life. If I suffer, that does not mean that God has forgotten me. That does not mean that God isn't doing his job. The Bible teaches clearly, consistently and regularly that all Christians will suffer pain and distress. And we should know that this is part of the deal of being a Christian. And anyone that tells you otherwise has not fully grasped the good news of Jesus. Now, in this passage, Paul's talking about the suffering that Christians will face because they are God's people in a sinful world. These are the troubles that Jesus described when he talks about the last days. But Paul says, in spite of everything, we are to rejoice when these sufferings come. And actually, Jesus says the same thing. If, if you've been following the Sermon on the Mount through with me on, 
on Fridays, you'll know that that starts with Jesus talking about the suffering that his followers will face. And the truth is that no positive Bible quote, no Bible verse meme, no encouraging word, good those things are, none of that can change the fact that life is hard for Christians and life is really rubbish now for many of us. We're going to get ill, we're going to lose our jobs. Looking at the bigger picture, we're going to be sidelined and maybe ridiculed and perhaps even persecuted for what we believe. God does not like suffering, he hates it. Christians should not seek out suffering in some sort of masochistic way. But Paul says in this passage, suffering can be productive if we respond positively, not with anger, not with bitterness. As Paul told the Romans here, it can produce perseverance, character and hope. So with four promises in, in all of this suffering, how do we know that God loves us? How do we know that he's on our side? How do we know that he hears our prayers and he feels our pain? And this is the key part of this passage. If we are justified, if we are put right with God, how on earth do we know? And the letter tells us that there are two key ways that this happens. And the first is there in verse five. And this is where we welcome the Holy Spirit. This is his first mention in the book. And, and it says here that the Spirit is the one who pours out the love of God into our hearts. He enters us. He transforms us. He assures us of God's love. And he assures us of the fact that we are saved. And we know this from other letters that Paul writes as well. And we learn more about what the Spirit does. For instance, in the letter to the Galatians, Paul talks about the Holy Spirit transforming our lives, enabling us to begin to live the way that God intended and to live up to those standards that we have so far fallen short of. But remember, this is still part of that same argument of promises to people who are justified. Uh, and that's really encouraging. You can't be saved and justified and not also regenerated by the Spirit. This is great encouragement for us, isn't it? You are saved, therefore the Holy Spirit is living in you. You are regenerated. But it's also a warning as well. It's saying if you think you can be saved and just have all the benefits, but not do something about it, not let God into your life and transform you through his spirit, then you've got the wrong end of the stick when it comes to justification. You've got to open yourself up to let God transform and change you if you are going to be saved and be part of his kingdom. We also need to remember that this, this promise of the spirit living us, that applies to everyone who has been justified. Yes, we might have some later special experience of God's love. He might gracefully touch us with something where we need a particular encouragement or a particular sense of his presence or a particular uh, situation where his, his gifts and his power are used in, this, in, in a great way. And that's fantastic. But that is not a prerequisite of becoming a Christian. Everyone who becomes a Christian has the Holy Spirit working in them. There is no higher level of spirituality that we need to attain in order to be a proper Christian. Everyone can be justified and everyone can have the Holy Spirit transforming their lives. So that's one way that we know that God loves us. But there is a second way in this passage that we know God loves us. And it is simply that he sent his son to die for us. And this is where we go from verse six onwards for the rest of the passage. And this is where if, if you're sitting on that sofa and you've been nodding off, you need to, 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 to wake up now. This is the news that we want to shout about online. This is the news that I want everyone listening in who might not normally come to our church. I want you to hear this. This is what we need to keep talking about in, in our reflections, in our Bible studies, in my Friday talks. This is the whole message of Romans. Jesus died for you. Now, as I said, we're, we're picking up this argument halfway through, but let me give you the, the headlines again. We are sinners. We have all done wrong. None of us is righteous. If you want to know just how far short of God's standards we fall, join me on Fridays looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And the punishment for rebelling against the perfect holy God who made the world, who made me, the punishment is death. Maybe not death straight away, but even that is only because God's mercy doesn't bring punishment straight away. But death all the same. Eternity without God. And that is not something that you want to experience. Some of you may say, well, I don't believe in God now and I'm doing perfectly okay. What's wrong with just carrying on like that? To which I say, you have no idea what life without God is going to be like. All good things come from God, whether you believe in him or not. 
and life in the future without the creator and the sustainer will be literally hell. And that's not the way that you were made. You were made for relationships. And we know that now, don't we? When our relationships are disrupted, you know how much pain that, that, that gives us. You were made to love and be loved. You were made to work. You were made to use your talents. And all of that will be made perfect when we have eternal life with God. And all of that will be lost if we don't turn to him. So if we're in this state, what can we do about it? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. We are ungodly. We are sinners. As Paul says elsewhere, we were aliens cut off from God, but he still loves us in spite of that. Now, the sin has to be dealt with. The, 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 the punishment has to be taken, but the punishment has been taken by Jesus on the cross. God still has to make us holy, but he has done that by putting us on us the perfect life that Jesus lived that he proved when he rose from the dead. That's what the previous few chapters have covered. And God has done that already while we were still sinners there in verse eight, showing just how much he loves us. Jesus doesn't give us a list of things that we have to do to be put right with God. He shows us what has been done already before we even knew it. And the love that God showed us, it wasn't conditional love. It wasn't doing a favour for a mate as an equal. It wasn't you scratch my back and I scratch yours. It wasn't even a, a noble, self-sacrificial love, giving up his life to save someone more deserving, like Paul talks about in verses six and seven in this passage. In fact, there's only one person who has ever not deserved to die, and that was the man who did die on a cross in our place while we were still sinners, just at the right time, while we were still powerless. Do you know that? Do you know that? If not, get in touch with me, get in touch with Laura, get in touch with any of the team that you see at the vicarage and talk to us more. And if you do know that, then how can we possibly ever doubt God's love for us? The God who made us and loves us has given us a way out of this most difficult challenge that we face, the problem of how we survive in the face of our rebellion. And he did it because his son died for you and he did it because he loved you but although we've got that hope of salvation ahead of us that was promise number three if you're following we're not quite there yet now if you're a christian and somebody asks you are you saved then one legitimate answer to that question is well yes and no yes we are saved from the punishment that we deserve because Jesus took it for us. But no, we're not yet back to, to the life that God wants us to live. That will have to wait until Jesus comes again. And the Bible is full of this now and not yet. Have a look at verse nine. We have been justified now, but we will be saved from wrath in the future. It's there again in verse 10. We have been reconciled to him. We shall be saved. There is a time coming when Jesus returns to this earth, where God's wrath will eventually come, where the sentence on those that have turned away will finally be carried out, where those that are not covered with a perfect life that God gives to us will be banished to hell forever. That time is coming, but we can be saved. Because even though we were God's enemies, as it says in verse 10, that's how it describes us, we were God's enemies, we were put right with God because Jesus died on the cross. And Paul says, if God has already done that now while we were still sinners, how much more have we got coming our way when he comes again in glory, when he welcomes us fully into a life in the new earth in his kingdom? And at the end of all this, what are we called to do? Well, promise number six, the promise is we can rejoice. We can rejoice because we have received great things that we don't deserve. We can rejoice because God's name is glorified when others see how much he loves poor, powerless, fallen, sinful people like me and anybody else who's saved. We rejoice when other people turn to Jesus, when others realise that they need Jesus because they see what he has done for me. And so what about you? Some of you will know all of that 
that I've just been talking about. Some of you will know that for yourselves. And maybe you're rejoicing now because you know that God loves you. You know what he's done for you. And even though things are tough now, and this world is a really rubbish place. You are rejoicing knowing how much God loves you and knowing the hope that you have got coming your way. Now, there may be others out there amongst the 50 or so of you online. There may be others who are watching this later on. And, and you might have heard this before. You might think that you're sorted. You might think that God's going to be fair to you. You might think eternal life is in the bag because you pray, you read your Bible, you log in on Zoom, you give to Food Bank, you do reflections on YouTube. But beware, God's wrath will come. There will be punishment. Some people that think they are saved will find out too late that they were relying on the wrong thing. Because you are powerless, you are ungodly, and Jesus has died for you. But you might never realise just how deep that love is for you. You might never realise how much you need saving. And you might never realise how amazingly generous our Father in heaven really is. And I beg you, don't leave it too late. Ask God to send his spirit now to transform you and to assure you of that love. And then there may be others, perhaps logging on for the first time. Perhaps those of you who've never even been in our physical building. Or maybe those of you who've been coming for years, but you're not really sure what you think. And maybe you're not sure now either. But you know that something's not right. Your life isn't right. You've got that, 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 that sense of, of nagging doubt about the things that you do and thinking this can't be the way that life was intended to be. And I know I've done things that I shouldn't have done. You know that life isn't right with the world. You see the pain, you see the anguish, you see the oppression, you see the prejudice around you. Maybe you've suffered it yourself and you think this can't be right. And to you, the message from today is there in verse eight. Even while you were still a sinner, God has already showed how much he loves you because Jesus came to earth and he died for you. And it doesn't matter if this is the first time you've heard this or the hundredth time. If you know that you need to do something about it, now is the time. God isn't socially distancing. God will, will hear your prayer if you pray right now. And you can pray now and we can pray with you. Get in touch with Laura. Do it right now. Do it on private chat. Um, Laura can leave uh, Paul and Jenny to, to finish the rest of the service. If you want to pray with Laura, if you want to pray with me, drop us a line right now. And we can do that now. We can tell you more about all the things that I've been saying. Talk to Laura, talk to Rich, talk to Christine, talk to anybody at the vicarage, talk to any of the leadership team and we can help you. And while you're thinking about whether you do that, I'd like the rest of us just to close our eyes and I'll finish with a prayer. Mighty creator God, you made us perfect, but we have messed things up. Messed up our lives, messed up our relationships, messed up our world. But you want us back, Lord, and you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus to die and rise again to give us a way back to you. I pray for all of those listening now that we would see this, that we would accept this, that we would do something about it. Maybe for the first time. We turn to you now. We know that we can do nothing to be saved. But we rely completely on the death of your son on the cross. We deserve nothing but we know that you love us. Send your spirit now to pour out your love on us and make us your friends once again. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Simon. That was an amazing sermon. And just to um, say that actually, and remind you that the ministry team are there offering Zoom prayer time anytime. So if you contact me, um, Christine or Rich with your email they will arrange a zoom time for you to be prayed for if you need prayer ministry it doesn't have to just be today it can be um, any time during this week they'll sort out appointments with you and send you zoom appointments so please do not go away from um, please get prayed for if you need prayer for please get prayer ministry that's what we're here for I'm going to hand over to Ed now and Ed's going to lead us into some intercessions thank you Ed I've got to unmute. I've got to unmute. Right? Am I there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let, let us pray. Oh Lord, we pray for your worldwide church, locked down and hampered at this time of social distancing. Help those members who feel isolated and lonely at this time. 
to draw close to you, draw close to, to you, to them, and let them know your presence. We pray for your church leaders as they try to minister to congregations and parishes they can no longer see. Inspire them and give them the gifts and the abilities they need. And we, we, we remember the Wick family as they move on, on Tuesday and pray that they will quickly settle into their new homes and situations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for the world at this time, especially, especially for places that do not have good health services. We pray for those who work in, in these, these countries. We pray, Lord, that they may be able to alleviate and stop the virus from spreading among poor people. And we, we pray for our own government as it tries to deal with the economic disaster of the coronavirus, as they try and bring lockdown easing in without causing a spike in the number of new infections result in the death of more people. We, we pray for our farmers at this time as they try to bring in the harvest. Pray Lord that, that workers may be found to bring in those crops that are, will, will rot if they're not collected. And we pray for all those working to, to, to try and keep the economy going. Lord, we also pray at this time for teachers and for pupils as schools start back. And at this time, we hold up all who work for our care services, for doctors, for nurses, and for many, other, many others, for care workers, working in care homes, people putting their lives at risks in their work. Keep them safe and help them to deal with problems that they have in their work. Lord, we, we pray at this time for uh, unrest in London um, with demonstrations to the far right. Pray Lord that, that you will teach all people to live in harmony with one another and that we may learn to to live in harmony with all people. Lord in your mercy hear our prayer. O oh Lord we pray for, for those who are, who are sick or suffering at this time. We pray for, for Anne Pinner's godson uh, family at, at this time of anxiety with the disappearance of their son. We, we ask for your presence with them at this time. And we pray for Francine who, who has a back problem and has difficulty moving around. Lord, in a moment of silence, we, we, we hold up all those known to us who are sick or suffering at this time. O oh Lord, at this time we hold up before you all who struggle with the uncertain future because of financial worries and and for those who can't see how life can ever get back to normal again pray lord that you will be close to them and we pray lord for those fighting for their lives um, with coronavirus 
and for those who've lost that fight. Pray, Lord, that you will be close to that family and ease their, their mourning at the loss of loved ones. We, we will close this time of prayer together by, by saying the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Ah, yep. I'll start again. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, it's me and Peter again. Just a couple of things this week. Uh, Peter wanted to sing a song, so we're going to sing happy birthday to a few lucky people this week. One's going to be Jackie Smith, one's going to be Edger, and one's going to be Simon Wiltshire. So I'd like us all to sing, so it's not just me and Peter, because we're a bit tone deaf, but we're going to sing, so if we could all sing together. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Jackie, dear Edger, dear Simon, happy birthday to you. Oh, apparently I've been told also I'm George. Happy birthday, I'm <laughs> and we've also been told to mention to you next week is Father's Day and male role models in general and we want you to send a picture in to Laura, me or the office or Steve Craggs and we're going to put all the pictures together and show montage next week. Be it can be a father figure, yes Laura. So a father figure or your father, whichever you want, okay? Any age. Well, baby one as well. Baby one, well, yeah. yeah. Any yeah. picture you want, anything which brings back loving memories of a father figure or your dad. Okay, so next week that's what we're going to do. So you can use the WhatsApp groups, email, um, even post it through the um, letterbox at the Vicarage. We'll do it. We can we can do anything really. So next thing is Peter's still going to carry on doing his Peter's um, story times that's just going to carry on all the way through lockdown and most probably beyond we don't know yet but the fruits of the spirits is coming to an end we've got two left and then we're looking at what to do yes Peter we are going to do something else so if you've got any ideas and you would like us to cover a topic let us know otherwise we are just going to pick another series and we're going to carry on doing it for the children um, and me and Laura because we I like it anyway so next week pictures of your dads or role models okay see you later everybody bye 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 come on get out of the way yeah. Yeah, right. <coughs> right just a few more notices before we conclude um I'm just going to give them then I will do the final blessing uh, thanks to Keith and Sally who we did around the church and made the church look really good so thank you so much for the work you did and those that helped with that that was great so thank you to, to Keith and Sally there the Rinks family um, aren't with us today their wi-fi is not working properly and um, they are actually packing and ready getting ready to to move now and to go um, thank you uh, they said for the video they love the video that we sent to them they said they've had a wonderful two years and they felt so much at home at st james and appreciated they felt loved by us all and they look forward to seeing us all soon so they asked me to just share that message with you just a reminder as well that we have the bible study on revelations on seven o'clock on tuesday night that me and jenny will continue doing that this week and um, we're going to do the whole of revelations 
Revelation. And then we have morning prayer at 9am on uh, Wednesday as well. Uh, both of those are on Facebook Live, so you're worth both on Facebook Live, but they are recording and they've put down on our YouTube channel, which has everything on it. So do join the YouTube channel as well. A uh, reminder about prayer ministry, which I reminded you about earlier anyway. And also David, David Mulford um, has um, mentioned the fact that um, it's true, many of us during this lockdown time have got a lot out of nature. I know that I've Paul takes loads of pictures of the foxes in the garden and things like that. And he's picked up on the Genesis 1, 21 that talks about how God has created everything. Uh, many of you have mentioned the benefits of it. So we wonder if those of you who have mentioned it or perhaps have taken pictures of nature or have... Um, recorded uh, something where listening to the, uh, the birds dawn chorus or something whether you could send those through to David that would be great via he says OneDrive Dropbox tra we transfer but not WhatsApp or Facebook because it needs to be good quality um, and any of those photos any of those audio clips um, he's gonna actually put them together into some sort of movie sequence so we can see them all and see what people really appreciated during lockdown as well so just to put that out as well 21st of June, just to mention the church is going to be open 2 to 4. Wednesday it's going to be open that week as well, um, uh, 10 to 12, for, for private prayer. There will be very strict rules about um, uh, sitting two metres apart, about what you can do and what you can't do. We'll make it very clear. Um, but if you do want to come along, do come along. We'll be there. Um, I say there will be rules and they'll be very clear. As you go in, you've got to use your you know use a sanitizer you're going to have to follow a certain route and stuff like that but we're around and it might be nice just to see someone physically so we are allowed to do that we are inquiring about tea and coffee but i don't know if we're allowed it yet we'll see i'm making all those inquiries uh, we'll keep you up to date on that but it will start on the 21st of june say so two till four so I'll be aware of that i think that's all i've got in the way of announcements isn't it yeah you'll be glad to hear so i think we're okay so i can do the our food, food bank, I think Martine's put something out on of her food bank, isn't she? So probably don't need to go to the yeah, she has. So please look on the thing now and see what we need on food bank. It'd be great to have an update on that at some point. And also then we are um, going to do the final blessing. Before I do that, if you remember, a, we're going to do the sort of giving chance. So I'm going to ask for, hopefully we've got um, coming up. That's it, that's lovely. So if you would like to give by text, um, and you're able to give by text, um, please do do that now if you'd like to. There you have. You just put St. James in big words, gap, and then the amount. Could be three, five, two, one, up to 20, um, through to 70450. Text cost amount plus one standard rate message. I need to let you know that. If you do not wish to receive marketing communications, I'm not sure you'll get any actually because we think it might be us that does it anyway and we're not doing that, but, but we need to let you know this text to St. James, no info and the amount instead um, and give whole numbers, pounds, I'd say to 20. So it's 70450, um, the number and St. James space, however much you wish to give. Um, I'm just going to pray for our giving now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you're a God who, Lord, loves us. Thank you, Lord, for all that we receive. May we, Lord, use everything we are given, financially and other ways, and in our gifts, for your glory and your kingdom. Bless it, we pray, Lord. Bless the things we're able to give as we give it back to you. And Lord, may the work that we do here change lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And the final blessing. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Good. Uh, and I just want to say hello to all you that will watch it on YouTube later. Great to see you. I know Stuart and Andrew. And also um, to all those of you on the telephone lines. I hope that you have enjoyed today. If it's Heather, I know that Helen Langley is now on iPad. Great to have Helen on iPad with us. Um, and then Dan, I think, on iPad as well. So, but hello to all those that you are on the, on the phone as well. Bless you all. Speak to you soon. <laughs>